everybody welcome to the daily lines press box we appreciate you joining us today um, we're going to take a few moments just to allow everybody to join the call joining us today is um, alex nicken he's going to be moderating this discussion um, speaking with uh, our legislative reporter joel ebert our um, our former um, intern caroline kuzbanski and the sun times um, chief, um, oh, chief politics reporter, Rachel Hinton. Did I get that right, your title correct, Rachel? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, we got a lot on the agenda today, so we're not going to hold too long, but uh, we will give another minute here to um, allow the rest of the attendees to join. So uh, thank you all for joining. Um, a few, uh, a few um, things to note just before this, the call begins. Um, we're going to be doing these, these conversations hopefully a couple of times a month. Um, in, 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 uh, and just this is more of a conversation between reporters talking about the topics at hand. So we hope that you will uh, follow along and uh, check back on the um, on the website um, frequently to look for our future events. I know we'll be having one coming up on um, uh, following this month's city council meeting too. So check back um, on the website. We will be sure to uh, include some of those notifications in our on our daily emails, um, morning newsletters. Excuse me. Um, so if you haven't uh, subscribed to that, um, check out thedailyline.com. There's places to join and sign up for our newsletters there. But um, Alex, I think we can go ahead and get started here. All right, let's jump into it. Can everyone hear me okay? We sure can. All right, we have a lot to jump into today, and there were hundreds, if not thousands, of, of bills uh, approved over the past several months in this spring session. Um, we have boiled it down to the six topics that we think are the most um, Significant salient right now. Um, we're going to start with the two that were that took center stage in this last um, two-day special session. Things that that got done or really rather didn't get done. Um, we're going to start off by talking about on that note the energy bill. Um, so massive list of proposals that were eventually boiled down into one proposal. This was, as I understand it, the major you know, intent of or the goal of, of this special two day session, right? So I want to start off by asking you, Joel, you know, coming into this session, um, what was what was the goal of the governor of the legislature on energy? And what was sort of like what was what was all the legislation and all of the efforts, you know, leading up to this session on on this topic? Yeah, so it, it's sort of multifaceted, right? Um, the main focus would be to get the state's energy sector or industry to transition uh, to be more and more uh, a more climate friendly uh, sector. Um, so you had everything from the Clean Energy Jobs Act, Path to 100. Uh, most recently introduced earlier this year was the Climate Unions Jobs Act, and then the governor's proposal, all with the central idea of trying to take. Uh, what is now arguably a, a dirty or an old, uh, you know, antiquated sector in making it more climate friendly along the lines of what uh, President Joe Biden wants to do. There are a bunch of different ways to do that. And so that was sort of this session long negotiation of push and pull. You had so many people on different, you know, sides. You had the governor's uh, proposals that wanted one direction. You had environmental groups uh, pushing for another. You had Exelon uh, and other um, energy, you know, uh, producing uh, companies that were all, and then you had the, the union organization. So it, it just threw all of these people together. And, you know, uh, at this point, seemingly, that is what the sort of stalemate is about, is how to proceed. You bring up Exelon, I understand that a lot of the negotiations in this bill centered around Exelon, that's just because of the nuclear plants that they operate that were in debate here, but also um, ComEd, which is a subsidiary of Exelon, as we know, has gone through many legal uh, issues, let's call them over the past year, and that was really front and center in this legislation. How did this bill address those pieces, and, and was there ultimately agreement reached on how to deal with Exelon and ComEd? There's there's several sticking points related to it. There's one about uh, providing a subsidy to Exelon for its its nuclear facilities to sort of as they look to sunset or close. Um, but one of the big issues is obviously over holding uh, this company that has been in the you know the center of 
uh, uh, what what would say what would be uh, the deferred po prosecution agreement with the U.S. attorney here in the Northern District, um, basically looking at how to add more scrutiny to a company that has uh, sort of uh, controlled or had heavy influence uh, in the legislature in the last several years. Uh, so you had everything from uh, trying to add um, new um, audits, I guess, of the company annually to uh, closing their ability to use ratepayer money for uh, contributions uh, to a, a myriad of other ways that would essentially hold um, ComEd or Exelon a little bit more of uh, their feet to the fire than they have been in the past. Again, some of those are still under discussion, but it looks like there will be a central component that will make major changes to the way uh, Exelon operates here in, in Illinois. So, Rachel, it looks like this got pretty close to the finish line. A lot of agreements were sorted out uh, specifically related to the nuclear power plants, how to subsidize them. Where did things start to break down here? It seems like the main, the last main sticking point um, was between labor and environmental advocates, uh, labor groups, specifically on uh, the prevailing wage provision as uh, the state begins to roll out new industries uh, focused on clean jobs, like, um, you know, electric vehicles and whatnot. Um, that's what Senate President Don Harmon said on Tuesday, I believe, uh, after the Senate adjourned without passing anything. Um, some environmental advocates say, you know, look, we've we've given up a lot of stuff. We've pushed things back maybe more than we really wanted to. Um, we want to see labor and the other uh, stakeholders here give up things as well. We want to see this be like a real compromise, real negotiations. Um, Right now, uh, it seems like that's still a, t a sticking point. I don't believe that the Senate will come back. Obviously, it's Thursday, so I don't think they'll come back this week. Uh, it's still up in the air whether or not they'll come back next week. But I think that that's the main thing that they're trying to figure out right now is trying to bring both of those sides together or more towards the middle um, so that both sides are happy. All sides are happy. I know that one of the biggest sticking points was this downstate coal plant that a number of different municipalities are, are invested in. Is it called Prairie State Energy? Um, where do things stand with that right now? And, and also, I mean, why did that one plant become such a big sticking point that continues to, you know, dog the, the legislative process? Sure. So Prairie State, um, back in May, right before the regular session ended, and it seemed like, you know, Governor Pritzker and the other stakeholders had come to a deal. Um, it seemed like Prairie State was the sticking point. Then uh, Pritzker wanted to close the plant. It seemed like Senate President Don Herman, as well as some other people, didn't want to close that plant because of the, um, the fact that municipalities own it. And I believe that the debt that they incurred to open it, build it, uh, has not yet been paid off. Um, and so that was a sticking point. There was uh, problems or um, debate, discussion um, about the closure of that plant. And then I believe a week or so later, Governor Pritzker unveiled his like revised energy proposal um, that said, no, I mean, Prairie State is one of the larger um, you know, polluters in the state. We can't say that we're going to go towards clean energy and allow for this plant to stay open. Um, but he did set up a system within that new proposal um, to try to go through like carbon capture and sequestration um, with the plant, which would hopefully allow for it to remain open for a little bit, but try to begin going more towards a, a clean energy route. Um, currently, it still seems like that plant will be uh, closed along with the other coal plants if, you know, the plan is still to go by 2035. Currently, that's still the number the year that I've heard um, that coal plants will will shut down entirely in the state. Um, but it seems like especially the lawmakers from those municipalities are saying this is this is a big deal for us and, and for my constituents. And we need to figure out a way to allow for this to remain open or incur a lot of uh, debt, a lot of, you know, which, you know, none of these municipalities can really take on right now. Alex, I would also add really quickly that it, it, it created that issue, Prairie State and, and the other local municipality owned uh, facilities, created an issue where you had um, union organizations and labor uh, joining forces with a lot of Republicans, uh, which, you know, really kind of created this interesting coalition where you saw some Democrats 
not a lot, but enough to generate enough questions about the ability for the bill to pass uh, with that provision not resolved. So uh, that'll be especially interesting to watch as it, it proceeds. Right. Can I jump in on that? Sorry. 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 Yeah, yeah. So uh, Senate, Senator Bill Cunningham said, you know, Tuesday as well, um, currently this is a battle between two really important Democratic constituencies. We have the environmental advocates and then we have labor. Um, so going off of what Joel was saying, it's really important for, you know, the people at the table to figure out a way to make both of these groups really happy because Democrats, you know, heading into an election ne year need money from these sides. They need the support of these sides. Um, and also, if they have a bill that doesn't make anybody happy, they're going to hear about it for a long time. Yeah. So I, I want to move on. But first, just last thing, I'm curious what you guys are hearing from the legislative leaders, from the governor's office and anyone else just about the viability of this going forward, whether they're confident that they can come back in a matter of weeks or months or if it's more like dead in the water. I would say all sides are optimistic, but look what that happened, what that got us in the last two weeks, right? People were optimistic two weeks ago that something would happen. Uh, so, you know, it, it really, I'm not gonna hold my breath, but you know, it would be a huge mistake or a failure of, uh, you know, all sides if this issue weren't resolved before, I would say the fall. Yeah, this was yeah. one of their biggest priorities going into the session, right? So if it doesn't get resolved, that would be, um, you know, egg on their face, uh, and obviously a problem for all of the energy industries and especially renewable companies that were really relying on something here. Um, okay, let's talk about the elected school board. This was something that the legislature um, did pass. We saw a vote from the House yesterday. Um, Caroline, you've been covering this. Could you bring us up to date on sort of what the proposal the latest proposal was on elected school board at the beginning of the session and sort of what it is now and the process of like how it got there i understand sure. it sort of ping pong between the chambers and, and changed in that process so the proposal that sort of started circulating um this of course being year six um of senator robert martwick really being one of the major proponents of this issue um, originally, it was going to be a 21 uh, member fully elected school board effective, I believe, in 2020, or that would basically start its operations in 2023. Um, that has now been pushed back. Um, and so now we would have a still a 21 seat board um, with 10 members elected um, in 2024, and then it would transition to a fully elected school board in 2027. Um, that the new bill also includes an undocumented um, parents advisory council um, and the sizes of the electoral districts for this board are about the size of a representative district and this is meant to prevent um, issues with campaign finance and special interests so it's about 135,000 people um, to a district and so this did pass after pretty extensive negotiations between Senator Martwick, uh, Representative Ramirez, uh, Senator or uh, Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford, and a number of other stakeholders over pretty vocal opposition from both representatives of the city and also representatives of Chicago Public Schools. And this ends, you know, basically 20 more than 25 years of mayoral control of the Chicago of the Chicago Public Schools Board which has been the case since about 1995. Um, so it was a big day yesterday in Springfield. Yeah, we know that as proponents of the elected school board will often remind us, Mayor Lightfoot promised during her campaign to support a fully elected school board. Um, since then, especially in the past couple months as this has come under the spotlight, there has been a real sort of scattershot of objections that she has raised. Um, could you walk us through what her objections were to that what the city, you know, CPS's objections were and what sort of Lightfoot's um, closing argument was here as we got into it? Yeah, they sort of threw the kitchen sink at it as far as um, counter arguments went. Um, but some of the main ones were the financial entanglements between CPS and the city of Chicago, especially relating to pension payments. Um, there was campaign finance and people continued to refer to Los Angeles where there's an elected school board and where those races are, you know, million dollar uh, enterprises. Uh, they're worried about basically school board members being in the pocket 
of special interests. Um, one name that I didn't hear mentioned up front a whole lot, but you know, was mentioned occasionally and definitely on everybody's minds with CTU. People are worried that it's basically democratic payback to the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, and then there was the issue of minority and undocumented parent representation on the board. So Lightfoot, um, during the earlier stages of this, I guess, battle, um, said that she was not going to support a school board that didn't have a parent carve out on the seat or on in within the bill um that has not happened the like i mentioned earlier the completed uh, legislation does include um an advisory council which um current cps uh president and uh former legislator miguel de valle um said was not really enough um of course this thing did pass eventually um, and Senator Martwick pointed out that the House co-sponsor, uh, Representative Ramirez, has also been extremely active on undocumented, um, you know, constituent issues, and uh, that there's Martwick, a trailer bill proposal too, yes, right? There's a huge trailer bill coming, and that this was sort of another issue um, in committee and also on the House floor. So I think. Robert Rita and uh, Natalie Manley uh, in the Ethics and Elections Committee in the House yesterday were both kind of skeptical that this bill was really ready to fly. Um, uh, Representative Rita did vote yes, Representative Manley did vote no, um, and they their main complaint was just the, the issue of campaign finance and the financial entanglement thing really they, they saw as major hampers to the bill being ready to do what they wanted it to do. And Rita said something to the effect of, I don't want to be back here next year saying, oh, we had good intentions, but we messed up. Um, even so, he did vote to advance the bill. And yeah, I, if I can it, if I can pivot away here just for a second, I want to talk more about the trailer bills in, in a second. Um, but Rachel, can you talk us through like what um, the discussion was yesterday that, that was brought up by CPS about the amount of money that the city of Chicago puts into CPS. I think that some people were having trouble sort of following that line of argument, why it's an argument against an elected school board. Can you sort of walk us through what that was all about? My understanding of it um, from sources that I spoke to was that Mayor Lightfoot, you, during her negotiation process or, or trying to maybe strong arm a deal that was more favorable to her said that she um, may not put money into CPS, like the city may not do that. Um, and so then that became a discussion of, well, is the elected school board and getting an elected school board worth it compared to the money that the city puts into the school district? Um, it's not clear to me how serious that is or whether or not that would happen. Um, I think that you know, this is a potentially a scare tactic. That's how it was uh, phrased to me by the people in the room. Um, you know, this is Mayor Lori Lightfoot trying to hold on to some sense of power to try to make sure that something that is more favorable to her passes. Um, it doesn't, I mean, obviously the bill passed, so I, I don't think that that worked. Um, but also there is a brick on the bill, a, a motion to reconsider filed by Representative Ramirez um, that, you know, until that is removed, the bill stays in the House. Um, Speaker Chris Welch said yesterday, you know, that's to allow Mayor Lightfoot some time to, to work with legislators and maybe find some sort of deal or compromise or something of that sort. Um, but it remains to be seen, I guess, what, what comes of it. And just specifically on that note of, of the mayor's negotiation here, we know that this, you know, as Caroline mentioned, this has been a priority of um, the Chicago Teachers Union and Senator Martwick, then Representative Martwick, going back uh, six years. It's been a long priority of the Chicago Teachers Union, and, and we saw that year after year, Mayor Rahm Emanuel was able to keep it bottled, up, keep it bottled up, and, and not let it pass. What is different about this year, this legislature, this this mayor. I think it's really down to the fact that she's new. Um, I think you would have to look at you know her relationships that she had in Springfield. Um, former Mayor Rahm Emanuel is a political animal. You know he's he's held a lot of different offices. He's been around for a long time. People really know him, and they know that. Um, 
or he has a reputation of, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours eventually, in most cases. Um, also, he might throw you under a bus, but it depends on what day of the week you get him or whatever. Um, and I don't think that Mayor Lightfoot has the same reputation um, as we've seen through some hacked emails and also just FOIA requests that have come out that the uh, Greg Pratt at the Tribune has, has tweeted. Um, she seems like a difficult boss. And from what I've heard during these negotiations, she's um, she's kind of a, a tough negotiator. Um, she has her plan. She knows what she wants. Uh, it doesn't seem like she really wants to veer away from that too much. So I think that that might be part of it. I think also we have two new leaders um, in the House and the Senate, even though Senate President Don Harmon is, is not technically new, but this is basically, I, I believe, his first full session. Um, and if not his first full session, then like one of uh, the first three or something for him. Uh, Speaker Welch, this is his first time. This is his first session that he's leading. Um, and so I think maybe it's her still needing to um, get situated, get uh, familiar with the two leaders and make sure that she has the right team in Springfield to make sure that what she wants passes. Um, and maybe, you know, next year, next session, we'll see something different for the mayor. But this session was was really difficult for her. I mean, sure, there, there may have been some wins for her, but uh, she really advocated against, you know, the, the firefighter pension bill, um, which would forgive me, I don't remember the specifics off the top of my head, but it changes the firefighter pensions. Uh, and then there's this, this is another huge loss for her. Um, so I, I mean, I, I assume for the mayor and for her team, they're they're really trying to figure out what to do differently for next year so that way they can point to more wins from Springfield. Yeah, as I remember the firefighter pension bill moved the date back, the birth date back for basically open more eligibility among firefighters for people who can get those pensions. So it's just more money that the city's on the hook for. She said it would be exactly. you know, a bad deal for the city. Um, real quick, before we move on from this one, I just want to come back to Caroline to talk about um, what trailer bill or trailer bills have been promised to this. There have been many issues that were that were brought up yesterday. And Joel, you can jump in here too if, if you want, because um, I know you're watching too. Um, what could be coming after this to, to, or what has been promised to people who voted for it to sort of clean things up or address concerns? So several representatives, um, especially in the committee uh, that happened on Wednesday morning, basically voted in favor of the, this bill um, based on Representative Ramirez's promise to come back and worry about campaign finance um, was the one of the major ones that I got um, as a like a commitment um, in in the next session. Um, and she could not promise, she said, um, a reconsideration on the size of the board, which people were also um, pretty concerned about. Joel, I might have missed though one of the major trailer bill um, things. Did I miss anything? I feel uh, like campaign finance no. was it. I would say one of the significant issues that needs to be fixed is just the enactment date. Um, during the floor debate, uh, I believe it was Representative Tim Butler, a Republican from Springfield, pointed out that there is a requirement under the current version of the bill that forces or calls for the legislature to draw new districts for the or uh, boundaries for the new districts. Uh, and that's a date before the effective date of the actual law. Um, so Ramirez said, yeah, we'll we'll fix that and and several other things. Uh, so there's a whole host of of issues uh, that that seemingly will be addressed at some point. It's just a matter of uh, it sounds like when. All right, so I want to move on to the next topic here, which is redistricting. But first, I want to just make sure that everyone who is watching this um, knows that they can that you should. Um, I don't know where exactly to point on the screen, but uh, in the chat box, um, ask us some questions. Uh, we want to leave some time at the end for Q&A. If there's something that you are not clear about, um, you know, in terms of the policy of something or the, you know, the chances of something politically happen happening that you're interested in, put that in the chat. We will pose it at the end. Um, okay, so we have new district boundaries for the next decade, unless a court throws them out. Um, getting ahead of myself a little bit there, but. Um, I guess to start off on this, Joel, you sat through dozens, hundreds of hours of all of these hearings that um, the redistricting committees held moving up to that. What were some of the themes that you kept hearing coming up? And do you feel like those hearings did anything to, to shape the boundaries that we're seeing right now? 
Well, it depended on who you were talking to. If you listen to Democrats, they were saying that they wanted to have maps that were reflective of the state's diversity and um, ultimately would have uh, equal representation for, for populations that may or may not have uh, had it in the past, right? So uh, high stress on, on giving equal representation to Latino and black and brown communities. Um, when you talk to Republicans and even some uh, advocates, they worried that they, the way that the Democrats were going about the process, essentially to include the use of American Community Survey uh, data, uh, would not allow you to have a sort of equal representation of those populations. Um, so the decision to use ACS data, of course, had to come because of the U.S. Census Bureau's delay in releasing decennial data. That will come out later this year, but because of a, um, a constitutionally set deadline that requires lawmakers to come up with maps, if they don't do it, it would the dis redistricting process would get handed off to a separate committee. By June 30th is the date for that, That's right? right, yeah. So Democrats were really imperative to highlight and say, we have to meet that deadline. Uh, Republicans, critics, others were saying, no, 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 you don't have to do that. Uh, so that was essentially some of the main themes. A couple of minor other things were largely about the lack of transparency during this process. The maps were drawn behind closed doors like every other redistricting process. Um, this is no different, but it, it is different with the argument that uh, has gone on in the last decade or so and gained momentum to try and take the redistricting process out of lawmakers' hands through a constitutional amendment, which of course failed uh, in the last uh, five or six years. So Rachel, looking forward at, um, or looking back, I should say, at this process that was run from start to finish really by Democrats while Republicans were you know, hosting press conferences outside of locked doors. Um, what were their goals here? And do you think that they were successful? Do you think that they got a win with, with these maps? What does it do for them at the end of the day? The Democrats, you mean? Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's a win in some ways because they've really pushed some Republicans into the same districts, or if, if not uh, Republican and Republican districts, then you have a Republican and a Democrat. Um, and they've also redrawn it so that I believe many of the new districts are um, with Democratic incumbents are areas or in areas, sorry, where um, Hillary Clinton won, uh, Joe Biden won, they're heavily Democratic. Um, so I think given the way that the process went, I would say that that's a win for them to try to ensure that they keep their Democratic majority in the House um, and that they uh, protect the incumbents that are currently there. Um, I do think that they kind of set themselves up in a way to be dinged for like the lack of transparency around the process uh, for kind of playing into the the Republicans complaints. You know, Republicans all throughout this process um, stood outside of locked doors, as, as you know, you pointed out. Um, they had regular press conferences calling for transparency uh, around this process. And, you know, Democrats, especially under the new speaker, um, really made a play or really talked about wanting things to be more transparent than they were under the Madigan regime. In some ways, you know, I think that they did do that. Um, there were a lot of public hearings, although, you know, some of them are going on at the same time, meaning the House committee was meeting at the same time as the Senate committee, or there were meetings on the weekend or, you know, what have you. Um, but I think in terms of trying to secure their majority, they did what they had to do. Um, whether or not these, you know, legislative boundaries uh, last, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't have a magic eight ball. I wish I did. Um, you know, two lawsuits so far, one filed by uh, the legislature's Republican leaders, the other filed by, um, you know, a Mexican-American oh, yes. legal defense fund. Oh, it's on the thing. <laughs> um, so Mexican-American I mean, legal defense and education fund. All that. Fund, yeah. Um, so I think that... Um, given that Republicans and also a Latinx group um, are raising concerns and are talking about this doesn't look very good for Democrats. And, you know, they, they both have pointed to the same issues, the use of ACS data and, and whatnot. Um, so I think that we'll have to see what the court says um, about these maps and, and whether or not they um, do what Democrats say that they'll do, which is represent, you know, people within the state effectively.
Yeah, and before we move on here, Joel, can you bring us a little bit more deeply into these lawsuits? Tell us what the allegations are here and, and specifically why or how they're different, what the Republicans are trying to do here versus what Maldef is trying to do. So the goal of the Republicans is, is essentially one of the goals is to force a separate process that would essentially allow them uh, to be more involved in the redistricting process. They want a court to basically say, let's get restarted on the, the redrawing of the maps, have this bipartisan commission appoint people on both sides of the aisle and come up with new maps. MALDEF uh, wants a, a sort of different appro approach where they want um, uh, just maps to be drawn in general, a little less specific about how. Um, but the, the two lawsuits essentially argue the same thing, that the use of ACS data will lead to uh, an undercount of minority communities, and that will ultimately violate the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, it, again, it remains to be seen if that will hold water, but this is an early test for the entire country. We are, I think, one of three or four states now that have maps uh, already, and to have the legal challenges already initiated um, will force a conversation on the use of ACS data that we haven't seen in many other states so far. Some of them adopted their maps have a bipartisan commission that have, have uh, led this. Illinois is not that way. So it's going to be uh, interesting and will be a huge win or defeat if the maps are um, knocked down by the courts against the Democratic Party because uh, the, the idea is whatever happens here could be taken by Republicans, Democrats and other states. And then these legislative leaders will be back to the drawing board, it looks like. Um, OK, so let's move on and talk about ethics. Um, I saw we did have one question, another second question coming in here. Uh, thank you for sending those. Keep them coming. We're going to try to get to them at the end. Um, you see Ann Gillespie up there. Um, who is the sponsor of this ethics bill that passed. Let's back up and talk about the context for this. Rachel, um, why was there pressure for the legislature to go at ethics um, this year? Why was this such a high priority for them? We've seen a lot of indictments um, and many of them circulating around uh, associates of former speaker Mike Madigan uh, relating to, uh, I mean, ComEd and the deferred prosecution agreement that came out. Uh, was accused of a years-long bribery scheme of trying to uh, influence and win favor from former Speaker Madigan. Um, and not only him, uh, they maybe paid money to uh, some of his associates for little to no work. Um, so we've seen many of those associates become indicted um, and for doing lobbying work that they either didn't disclose or wasn't exactly lobbying under the terms of the law. Um, and so there was a lot of pressure from, you know, outside ethics groups, as well as from within the General Assembly itself, to really tighten these like loopholes that allowed for, you know, former Senator Arroyo, um, Michael McLean, others to do lobbying for on behalf of someone without it actually being called lobbying or without them actually you know, um, filing and saying that that's what they're doing. So the bill that was introduced and passed um, tightened some of the revolving door loopholes and uh, requires for people to um, disclose more on their statements of economic interests or whatever. Um, but many Republicans, you know, before this bill passed said that it doesn't go far enough, that the bill, especially one of the revolving door provisions for uh, lawmakers who leave, um, is written in such a way that, you know, someone could be, uh, you know, barred from lobbying after leaving the General Assembly for as much as six months or as little as one day. Um, and so their point was, we really need to tighten this more. We can't just say, okay, now we've passed ethics legislation, even though it's not perfect, but we've done something. Their, their response was, we should have done something better than this. Um, despite that, it still passed both chambers. And I believe with uh, a fair number of Republicans voting in support of the bill, um, I think because many people feel like, okay, this is a start. And also Senator Gillespie said, it's not perfect. We're going to keep working on it. Let's get this done now. Um, what could come up next time, you know, next session, what's in the works. I'm not entirely sure yet. I think that there's still discussions going on around that. Um, but I think that the consensus says, okay, you know, this isn't great, but it's a good start. Yeah, Joel, this seemed like 
kind of similar to what we were talking about with what happened with elected school board, that a lot of legislators said, OK, I'll pass this or I'll vote for this on the condition that we're going to go revisit it later. Right. We know that, um, as Rachel was saying, a lot of third party, you know, watchdog watchdog groups have raised concerns, issues that they you know want to be included in there that were not. Um, I'd encourage everyone to go back and listen to Joel's podcast interview from last week with Elisa Kaplan at Reform Illinois for more on that. Um, what, how about, you know, the governor, uh, legislative leaders, those legislators themselves, how open are they to going back into this and, and what specific provisions, if any, have they signaled a willingness to, to add in to strengthen this? So I think it, it depends on who you talk to, right? So the governor uh, has already said he would like to see a stronger revolving door than the six months requirement that was included. Um, House Speaker Welch, when I talked to him last week, had no real problems with the bill. He liked it. He said that he didn't think it needed additional tightening up. Uh, I don't believe uh, we've heard um, Senate President uh, Harmon talk about this that much, but you've also had, um, again, advocates and uh, even the sponsors admit there were certain things in the bill that maybe uh, you know tighten one thing but didn't go another. So, for example, the uh, Legislative Inspector General's office has been one uh, thing that has been in the background of discussion for years about how to give it more true independence. Um, under the uh, previous uh, iteration of that office, essentially the LIG would need um, permission from lawmakers to move forward with a case, to investigate something, to issue subpoenas. Well, they uh, removed that requirement for them to get permission to initiate a case, but the way that the bill was written, essentially uh, it, it, they would still need a, a complaint in order to uh, create a, an investigation. Um, that sort of, some people have said, ties the hands of the LIG in a very different way that wasn't the way before. Um, the LIG also still needs to get permission to subpoena, um, uh, to issue subpoenas from lawmakers. So again, there are certain things that I think will be um, talked about uh, as, as, as priorities. The question is, how soon will they act? I mean, it took two plus years to get this issue uh, to actually cross the finish line. Uh, and it was introduced on the final day of what was supposed to be the end of the legislative session. So for those uh, in the world of ethics, um, they're probably not holding their breath that this is going to be something that will come up very soon. But uh, as we know, the ongoing um, investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office is still going, uh, which could lead to additional changes and calls for reform in the future. Right. It seems like this is probably not going to get out of the headlines anytime soon as much as they, they maybe wish it would. Let's talk about weed. Um, the cannabis, uh, I guess you could call it a trailer bill that passed um, now a few weeks ago. This didn't come up in the special session, but um, take us back a little bit through the context behind this, Caroline. Um, the In 2019, we know that the legislature passed this sweeping legalization with a heavy focus on equity and giving um, priority to certain what's called social equity uh, applicants. Um, what happened there? Why? Yeah, what happened? It really didn't quite go to plan, unfortunately, which we heard a lot about when the trailer was being discussed. So out of the original 75 slot lottery, only 21 licenses were granted, um, and only six of those license recipients were social equity applicants, people whose communities had been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, people with uh, you know, histories of incarceration related to, um, to basically weed possession. And people in the in the legislature and in the advocacy space said we have to do better. And so this HB 1443 was an attempt at that uh, courtesy of Representative LaShawn Ford in the House and uh, major uh, Majority Leader uh, Kimberly Lightford in the Senate. And it did pass and it passed you know, pretty substantially um, in both chambers. And there are still a ton of skeptics uh, that are out there, um, many of whom are minority growers and minority applicants who are not sure that this is actually what the what the kind of burgeoning cannabis industry needs. 
um, to you know improve its um, equity score, I guess. Let, and let's so, talk about this specific bill, the Sean Ford's bill. What would it yeah. do? How would it try and remedy the situation uh, that you know the issue with not getting enough of those social equity licenses out? So the bill first provides for the original 75 slot lottery to be rerun. All of the people who applied for a license in that lottery are going to be rescored and have I still I think I'm waiting to hear back from the state on their deficiency uh, notices. So things that they um, things that their application was missing so that they couldn't get um, you know the maximum possible score. Um, so one person I spoke to, Mike Malcolm, said that he, you know, he's lived in Illinois all his life, but he didn't get the points for being an Illinois resident on his application from the state. Um, so he is waiting for a rescore of his application, and then he'll be re-entered back into that lottery. Um, the new legislation also provides for five new medical dispensary licenses, also distributed by lottery, and then two more um, 55 slot lottery so for a total of 110 new licenses um people this the lottery thing is really where a lot of people are getting kind of upset and annoyed because at one the two new lotteries you can only apply for up to two licenses the original lottery you could apply for up to 10 um and they are doing an 85 percent cut score instead of asking that applicants to be entered in the lottery have a perfect score and so what one source said to me was if I, you know, if I have a 99% on my application um, and I get entered into that lottery, that's great. But my, you know, my competitor who only has an 86%, you know, could also get entered into that lottery. And what if that that person gets the the thing over me? And because some people are partnering with uh, what are called multi-state operators or MSOs um, to get their applications written and MSOs can basically become social equity applicants by making certain hiring pledges um, or pledging to uh, operate um, in a way that, you know, targets uh, communities who have been historically disadvantaged um, by drug legislation. Uh, they, people are really skeptical that this is actually going to produce more equity in the industry. And one, I thought pretty telling example of that skepticism and a pretty high profile one was Representative Hammonds, um, who basically stood up on the House floor and questioned Ford about why people from Indiana or Michigan or Canada could have dispensaries and licenses in Illinois. And Ford said, well, they're still, you know, they're still not going to get as high scores as the Illinois residents who are here um, because you get, you know, more points on the application for that. Um, and Ammons basically said to him, you know, she's an original architect of the 2019 legislation, and she said, I'm voting no on this because you've written a bill that supports and reinforces certain communities, but not not ours. And she was not happy about that. Do you want to hear about ethics provisions or do you? Want me to so I, I, I want to jump back to one thing that you were saying about the scores, because I remember that a concern that was brought up last year is that there was such a high standard that one of the reasons that it seemed like so few operators got selected is because everyone basically had to have a perfect score yeah. um, and not everyone had that. And then there was some um, lawsuits that came alleging that those companies that had perfect scores were politically connected. But now it sounds like you're saying that it's going back uh, that people are concerned that by lowering the minimum threshold to an 85, that might be overcorrecting a little bit? Yes and no. So one of the things that was causing, I mean, this is also, you know, I'm an intern. This is a hugely complicated piece of legislation. I definitely don't have every like nuance of the whole, you know, years long battle right at my fingertips, but People, one of the main reasons that people weren't getting, I'm so sorry, I also live right next to a helicopter landing pad. One of the things that people were really unhappy about was that to get a perfect score, you basically had to be a veteran of the military. And so Mike Malcolm, who I mentioned earlier, I'm sorry about the helicopter, um, said, you know, I would have gotten a perfect score if not for not being a veteran and so people have been lobbying to get that uh, basically taken off the list of criteria mm -hmm. um and then i think so that's where like the cut score can come in handy uh, with yeah. what advocates saying if you're not a veteran then that would come really so 
we'll have to uh, definitely be looking over the course of the next couple of months to see how those lotteries work out and, and if there are complaints raised again. Um, we are running a little short on time, so I want to make sure that we touch on our last topic, um, which is the budget. Um, possibly the biggest, probably the biggest single piece of legislation that was passed. So let's just, you know, run through it in a couple quick minutes. The, the one thing that I wanted to drill down on is this question of quote unquote, corporate loopholes that uh, the governor proposed closing. At least that is how he put it. That is not how um, businesses put it. They said that they were really important incentives that enable business. So Rachel, I, I guess to really boil things down, can you talk about who some of the winners and losers were in the final product as Fritzker you know, pulled back on some of his um, corporate loophole proposals? I can. Um, there was one, some of the names of these currently escape me, um, and I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me, so I apologize for that. Um, there were protests around one for like scholarships for kids that I, if Joel, I, I don't know if you remember the name of that one. Um, that one did not get cut, so those kids are a winner. Uh, I would say overall, I, I think in the budgeting process, I would say Governor Pritzker is a winner as well, um, given that some of these loopholes were cut. Uh, the state has a budget, no new taxes and whatnot, especially given you know the pandemic and people not wanting new taxes or not uh, having the funds to be able to pay those new taxes. Um, I believe corporations here, um, corporations and Republicans would say, I think that they're more so the losers in, in this situation, if you could pick the loser. Um, these some of these loopholes were things that they uh, negotiated on in the 2018-2019 budgeting process, especially around uh, the capital plan um, or during the negotiations around that. And so, for the loopholes to now be some of them to be rolled back um, is a is a loss for Republicans and some businesses. But I think overall, um, I think Pritzker wanted to close five or six loopholes, and I believe. And at the end of the day, like three ended up being closed. Um, you know, speaking on a broader level, I think Democrats in some ways are also kind of a loser because uh, there was a mistake in the budgeting bill. And so the governor had to issue an amendatory veto, which allowed Republicans another chance to uh, knock them again for the lack of transparency in the, the process. Um, the budget was passed like in the House uh, shortly after 1130, I want to say. Um, there were missing effective dates, incorrect effective dates. Um, and that's what, you know, they pointed to with like, that's why we need to introduce really big bills before, you know, 1145 right. at night at the end of session. So sort of a weird hiccup there at the end. Um, thanks to to Amy. It sounds like you were talking about the Invest in Kids Act, which I think is a yes, subsidy for it. private school scholarships. Is that right? Um, Joel, let me let me put it to you this way. Who are you hearing complain the loudest about the budget and what ended up in it and not in it? Uh, it's largely business groups uh, like the Illinois, Illinois Manufacturers Association and Republicans who basically say, um, look, these changes that the governor proposed, uh, and actually this slide I wrote, uh, I, it said six of nine recommended changes were adopted. I think it was actually four of nine, so apologies for that. But in total, it will save the state a combined $665 million or so out of the $932 million that the governor proposed. Um, but you have business groups basically saying these are going to result in a tax increase on us, which will then be poured down uh, and paid by consumers. Um, so they basically say that this is going to make Illinois less friendly for businesses to flock to, especially at a time when we are in the midst of the pandemic's recovery. Right. So why um, uh, cut struggling industries off at their knees um, at a time when they're already weakened? Um, those would be the biggest critics of this budget. So specifically, before we move on to questions, I remember way back in 2019 that one of the biggest victories that Republicans said that they achieved from uh, the the feverish sort of end of 2019 legislating in the spring session was that they got a repeal of the franchise tax, um, which now ended up, um, I believe, still added back into the budget. Can you just quickly... Tell us what the franchise tax uh, is and sort of what it means now that it is it is back. Yeah, I'm trying to find my um, uh, my notes on that one. Hang on, Alex. Uh, I do. Basically, it's a, it's a tax that some of these businesses have to pay that you're right. It was um, uh, 
a, a decision that was made several years ago. Uh, Governor Pritzker at the time touted it as, again, making the state uh, more business friendly. Uh, essentially, this tax would generate about $30 million annually for the state. Um, but, you know, in the in the more recent discussions, um, uh, Democrats, including the governor, have said, look, times have changed. We are now in a COVID period. We had to reevaluate the books. This isn't necessarily me breaking my promises, unlike what Republicans are saying, that you're flip-flopping. Um, but that, you know, just because we agree to something one year uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever. So I think you can make that argument uh, about a lot of these different pro provisions, but this was definitely one that uh, businesses themselves uh, really zeroed in on and said, uh, this is going to uh, dramatically harm us. But overall, the uh, Democrats that were touting this uh, and including Deputy Governor uh, Dan Hines said this is paid for by the uber rich, the people that are not, um, you know, your mom and pop businesses. All right. So let's go to Q&A. Um, please keep the questions coming. If uh, you have any in the chat box, starting um, with a question on uh, redistricting. What do you think that the repercussions will be to Governor Pritzker, if any, um, for remember when he said he would veto any partisanly drawn map. Um, you could definitely argue that the approved map is a partisanly drawn So Todd asks, what will be the repercussions for Pritzker waffling on his campaign promise of vetoing a map drawn by one party? I think whoever. <laughs> Sorry, I should have posed that visual. Uh, I, I think whoever uh, the Republican nominee for governor is will we'll ding him on it. I think he'll hear it on the campaign trail. I expect for it to be. Um, you know, something that could come up in an ad, you know, Governor J.B. Pritzker said that he was going to veto a map and yet he didn't follow through on his word. Um, so I think that this will continue to kind of follow him. I don't know that it will be a main sticking point, though, in the gubernatorial race. I would agree with you. Man, getting <laughs> myself ready already for that um, campaign ad voice we're going to start hearing everywhere before too long. Um, on that note, uh, Richard asks, when will Governor Pritzker sign the bill moving the 2022 Illinois primary to June 28th? Safe to assume he's going to sign it? Seems it's in his political interest to have the primary delayed to that date. That brings up this massive election omnibus uh, that we did not get to discuss here. So thank you for bringing that up, Richard. Um, anyone want to take that one? Uh, does Has he indicated that he's going to sign that bill? Uh, he hasn't really discussed that one so far, but, uh, you know, uh, one would think that he would, right? Because look at the timeline. If he doesn't, uh, the filing deadline would be coming up uh, or or the circulation period would be coming up for a March primary as early as this fall. Um, this buys uh, everybody more time. Uh, one of the big provisions in that bill was the idea of delaying this would allow county governments more opportunity uh, or a longer period to uh, create their redistricting maps. Without this legislation, they would have had to do it um, very soon, and they they would have had to do it without the American Community Survey data, potentially, or without the census data, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I would say that it, it looks like, in all likelihood, the governor will sign it. I don't see any repercussions to um, pushing back on this so far, but we haven't heard from him directly on this, from what I remember. Yeah, I can add in my coverage of uh, Cook County's um, redistricting process, which is now underway, that the reaction from Cook County commissioners broadly has been a massive sigh of relief. They had been under pressure basically to um, pass, you know, codify a new map before petitions were supposed to start being passed on August 30th. They would have had two weeks to do so after the final census data was released. Um, now they have until January. The early January is now in petition passing season. Well, will get underway, assuming that Pritzker signs it, which um, it seems like a lot of folks are already making plans um, under the assumption that he is going to sign it, including uh, or at least state, that part of it. Including the State Board of Elections. They had a meeting this week with the uh, assumption that it, it will be delayed and signed. On that note, Amy asks, will session end date change due to the election date change? I guess you're asking about next year, it will, like will the session maybe go into to June? Um, any thoughts on that? Have you heard anything about that? No word yet on that. Um, 
I mean, they're supposed to end by May 31st. Obviously, as we've seen this week, they can come back uh, if there's unfinished business um, to get to. Uh, so I, I assume that they'll probably still keep with the May 31st deadline, but call people back into session if there's more work to be done. And we have one last uh, nice wonky question from Amy. Hearing that a flat budget is in reality a hit for state agencies and too much reliance on increased Medicaid FMAP, which is temporary. Any thoughts? You guys hear anything about reliance on Medicaid FMAP? I have not. I, I'm not in a position to be able to say, you know, articulately um, what I've heard on that. Uh, the, the, the one question is how the budget is relying right now on using some of the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan money, and balancing out using some of that now versus in future years. Um, so I think it's sort of, uh, there's, there, I wouldn't call it a shell game, but it's it's just a balance, a juggling act right now, right? To use portions of it to help the state prop up some of its money for this current fiscal year, and then do that same kind of trick in the future years. But yeah, it is a real good question uh, that we still need to dig into this three thousand plus page funding document that got dropped a little over two weeks ago, just before midnight. Um and. She also brings up the UI Trust Fund, which brings us to the last thing that if no one else has any questions beyond that, I'm, people can continue to add questions if they want. But um, if we can go to the next slide, we just have a list of things that we are looking at going forward. And um, unemployment insurance is, is one of them. Um, obviously, we're going to be watching what happens with the energy bill next. We talked about that. Um, do you want to just quickly run through some of these, Joel, starting with the, the unemployment insurance uh, issue that Amy brought up there? Yeah, so um, there's at least consensus that it's a massive hole, that the unemployment trust fund um, uh, is somewhere in the ballpark of $5 billion. Um, yesterday on the floor, Republicans were really pushing the issue and saying that this budget, that the governor issued an mandatory veto, had uh, done no changes to address the unemployment insurance trust fund. Um, that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, there is acknowledgement on both sides of the aisle that it needs to be addressed. I would anticipate some work being done on that, or at least uh, some discussions on that um, this summer uh, in the anticipation that there might be able to be ways to use the um, ARPA money for that. Uh, as far as some of the other issues, um, we'll keep an eye out on how this new budget and the state's work um, financially will improve uh, its credit standing. Um, ratings agencies earlier in the year had been suggesting that there was some improvement, but I think the way that the budget was constructed and, and, and um, you know, efforts to uh, pay down the federal uh, money that we borrowed late last year um, early will probably be uh, looked at very uh, positively by credit rating agencies. So that's something we'll keep an eye on. And of course, um, uh, keeping an eye on whether the governor is going to veto any bills. He's issued an amendatory veto. He issued a veto of a bill from the January session uh, that was later changed and then uh, signed into law related to prejudgment uh, interests and litigation cases. But uh, so far, um, we haven't seen any signs of him looking at vetoing other bills from this session. You know, Rachel, this might be a little more far afield, but I had heard Speaker Welch ask about whether he thinks that a new push for a graduate income tax could be in the cards at some point now that the last one, as we saw, failed um, last year. And he said something to the effect of, you know, not this year, but we got to try it again at some point in the future. What is your, your read on that? I mean, I, I don't think that it'll come up this year. Um, I don't f expect it to come up within the next session. Um, I think that, you know, Democrats are still um, recovering, are still kind of doing a postmortem on the, the fair tax campaign of last year um, or the last election. And so I think they're still trying to understand what went wrong, what they could have done better. Do they need more money? Do they need to, how, how did they mess up in their messaging? Um, and I think, you know, it's one thing for Speaker Welch to be on board with it, but I think that you really need the governor, you need Senate President Don Herman, you need others to be on board with, you know, doing another push for a graduated income tax. And I'm not sure. Saying that nothing those... of 60% of voters. <laughs> and 60% of voters, obviously. Um, I, I'm not sure right now that, that there's an appetite to do that. 
I, I asked the governor about this in one of his uh, COVID avails a couple months back, and he seemed to pour any cold water that he had on, on the idea that he would try this again. I mean, it was sort of a bruising defeat and to put pretty much all of his money into that effort and to have it uh, fail. Um, to do that in 2022 um, when you're running for re-election, that's probably not the best formula. Yeah, that's a good point. Speaking of trying things multiple times, um, uh, just one thing I tacked onto the end there, um, Fritz Kagey's property tax data modernization bill. This is something that he has been proposing now for three years, and it uh, looked like there might have almost potentially at some point been a deal between him and, and real estate and labor uh, and business groups this year, but that fell apart. You can read our coverage of that, and so I'm going to be looking at that. Uh, going forward would have big implications for property tax bills and um, assessments. So look at that right at the hour mark. Um, that is it for this uh, press box. Really want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we again hope to do these at least you know once, maybe twice a month. We're looking at potentially doing one after next week's uh, Chicago City Council meeting, which is going to be a very big one. So um, yeah, follow us on Twitter, subscribe, uh, read the Sun Times. Um, yeah, back to you, Don. Yeah, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to Rachel for uh, joining us today. Uh, it was a special thank you to you guys, uh, Carolyn, Joel. Thanks for joining the call as well. Um, to everybody that joined, um, please sign up at thedailyline.com if you're not getting any of our emails. Um, you can do so there. Um, lastly. Um, we are still fielding our Chicago Index survey. So if you haven't participated in that or would like to learn more, um, there is a link on our homepage and um, you can go there to, to uh, find out more information about that. Or simply reach out to me, don at thedailyline.com and I'd be happy to uh, talk that over with you. All right, everybody, you can find a recording of this, um, of this meeting on our website in a couple of hours, but we will be sure to follow up with an email to say thank you and provide you a link to that as well. So until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.